everything in the Bible? It mentions it. There's got to be some things you can go like this or like this or whatever, you know, when we get there. But it's the Bible, it's the Word of God. So the Bible is a realist book. You know, God wrote it in realist language. He gave it to us so we can understand it. And it's earthy and it's true. And it's God's Word. That's the amazing thing about it. That really is God's Word. Well, let's get to Matthew 8. But we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We had just seen Jesus in the boat calming the storm. And the disciples are flabbergasted once again from this miracle. And, uh, and so, you know, they, they say, who is this, right? And we know the answer to that is, who is, who is he, right? He's the Lord of glory. This is our God, right, of all creation. So we, we come now to verse 28, and uh, we'll read to the end of this chapter. And this is the text that we will look at today. So Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 and following. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine, Feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for allowing us to meet together. Thank you for the joy that you give us being part of the body of Christ. But I pray that, that you would speak to us through your holy word this morning. And may you be glorified in it all. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So he, he, this, this is an amazing text. Um, reflected on this text a lot of times. And I, I've come to the conclusion that this text includes in this latter part. The saddest words of the New Testament. These are, they have to be the saddest words encountered in the New Testament. Not that they're the worst thing that could ever happen, but they're sad because you have a whole city coming out to Jesus Christ. That's what it says there, right? It says the whole city came out to meet Jesus. Now you think, well, a whole gathering of people, that's really good news, right? <laughs> My father used to tell me about um, when you hear of a lot of cherries, you take a small basket. I mean, that can be translated into many circumstances, I guess. But his point was never trust the numbers or the rumors of the numbers. The numbers in themselves don't mean anything. You may have quantity without quality. And here you have quantity without anything. You just have quantity, that's it. There's nothing to it. They come out, the whole city, and these are the saddest words that you will find written in the New Testament. They told Jesus to depart from their region. In other words, we don't want you. We don't want you. We don't want what you have. We are not buying what you are selling. Get out of here. The saddest words that you will read in the entire New Testament. Now today, we, we don't, we're not as bold as these. These people were forthright. You know, this is just plain, open unbelief. This is just plain taking a line, drawing a line in the sand, taking a stand and saying, look, we are here. This is where we stand. You're over there. We don't want you. You get out of here. 
Today we're not like that. Today we want to be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We like to be on the line to put one foot here and one foot there. We want Jesus, but then we don't want everything he stands for. We want Jesus or we want the idea of Jesus, but we don't want everything that comes with that. We don't want the commitment. We don't want the truth. We don't want the real Jesus. We want the cuddly Jesus. We want the, the Jesus that, that comes and does what we would like him to do. And the great irony in this passage is that the people of the city who came out to hear him told him to go, and it is the very demons of hell that recognize who he is. And the demons, in their demon, feverish demon constitution, recognize him to the point where they ask him permission to go into the cow, into the, the pigs. They who are condemned to eternal destruction with the devil and his messengers, right? They are condemned eternally. They know it. They recognize before them stands the Son of God and they implore him and they beg him and they say, may we have permission to go. Because they know who he is. And yet these people who are in the land of Palestine, they are the people of God. They are the ones who know. They are the ones who should know. They're the ones who ought to know. Tell him no. No, we're not as brazen as these folks. We're certainly not like the demons. We're more apt to command God rather than ask Him permission. What's the new movie out? The War Room? Oh my goodness. I haven't seen it and I don't plan on watching it. Because it's, a, it's an Armenian version of the gospel. It's all about, you know, if you think hard enough, pray hard enough, believe hard enough, you'll get what you want from God with the assumption that God wants you to have everything that you want from God touched by an angel of theology that's what I call it God loves you, God loves everyone and there's no mention of Christ in touched by an angel they dare ever say the words Jesus Christ in that series, I used to watch it when I was younger and then I realized after you know a while hey, you know, this, this really isn't I mean, it might make for wholesome TV if you want to use that word, but certainly not Christian. And these so-called Christian movies are more of bending God's will to our own rather than us. Even like these very demons submitting to the will of God. Permit, permit us, if it's your will, it's... No, we, we're, we're on the fence. We, we, we do the same thing, but we don't say it in the same way. When we tell people that our gospel is such and such, when we tell people that, you know, our denomination is such and such, when we tell people, you know, well, this is, this is the tradition, this is how it ought to be, we are really no different from these city dwellers who turn Jesus away. Because if we do not believe in the true Jesus, the one revealed in the entirety of the Bible, we are believing in a figment of our own imaginings. And the Bible has a word for that. It's called idolatry. And as A.W. Tozer said long ago, he said, the idolatry of the mind is just as repulsive to God as the idolatry of the hands. Very few of us in the evangelical church would actually worship an image or an icon or a statue. But hey, we've got flags in our congregations. We've got drapes over the cross. We've sanitized everything that's brutal about the crucifixion. And we've turned it into, you know, Jesus being, uh, what was it? He, he was crucified between two thieves. And now he's crucified between two candles. And it's pretty. We're basically telling God, we don't want you. We want something that's conducive to our life, to our mentality. We, 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 we won't tell you to go, but if you come, come on our terms. We like Jesus, but we like him on our terms. And have Jesus on your terms. It's better to just say, look, Jesus, look. 
Get out of here. Just, just go. It's better to do that. A friend of mine, I don't know where he read this, but he, he said this a long time ago from my friend Ray. Um, I, I think he, got, he might have got it from Ravi Zacharias or someone else. But he said that if the Holy Spirit were, were in some sense, to just leave, you know, like in, in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, where the glory left, and you could see it in stages moving away. Now, if the Holy Spirit just left all of evangelical Christendom, 98% of what ordinarily goes on would still go on. You think about that, that if the Holy Spirit were removed, we'd pretty much go through the motions and do exactly what we've been doing. All the, all the seats will be plush and cushioned. Air conditioning will be just right. Music will not miss a beat. The pastor will be draped in his usual Sunday attire. You know, not a hair out of place. Smile just right. The drama team would not miss a cue. Everything will be done to perfection. The pursuit of excellence is a godly thing, is it not? Yet the question beckons, is Jesus in that, really? Even though you call this the worship of Jesus, is Jesus really in it? Or are you like these people saying, Jesus, we don't want you with your version, we want you with our version. We prefer to have you, but on our terms. And today, this is what is happening. Cities are filling these auditoriums where you have thousands and thousands that come into these places of worship, supposedly, seeking Jesus, but in the heart of hearts, every single one of these people is telling God, on my terms, not on yours. Folks, if there is a message for the 21st century church in the United States, in the Western world today, it is this very truth. That we can't have Jesus on our terms. That trying to have Jesus in our own terms is like telling him to get out of here. It's just like telling him, we don't want you. If the only, this is, I'll tell you what, this, I've, got to, I've got to tell you this because I like a lot of their music, but I actually went to see this band, Chris and Brooke, a long, long time ago, many, many moons ago, in, in uh, Boston. I went with Chris. We went to see the newsboys. They had a, rented out a school facility. And I guess every evangelical in the greater Boston area showed up. It was jam-packed. The newsboys were there. And we didn't know anything about this. And we went with the young people of the church. And it was like, you know, th this was like 20 years ago. And we felt old, right? Back then. They've come up with a hymn, right? They've come up with a song. And there's a line in their song. And it talks about God and all this. Da, 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 da. And it has this line at the end and it says, that's how I want my God to be. And you think, wow, this is God-centered music. And I don't know what the latest history of the news was. I really don't care. I, I'm not a follower. I don't know what's going on in their lives. But let me tell you, that line is exactly the ethos of the evangelical landscape in this country. It produces, it directs, it envisions, it prepares, and it presents a Christianity that is to the tagline. That's not how my God is. In other words, everything we put forward is the way we envision God. It doesn't matter what you want your God to be. God is. And you either submit to him as he is, or you are basically telling him, get out of here. There is no making God in your image. That is mere idolatry. It is better to be like these people and say, God, we don't want you. Take our stand, we'll go to hell.
Notice that there were two demon-possessed men. These guys were extremely fierce. It says no one could go through the way. Imagine, here's two guys, right? They're demon-possessed. So they're exhibiting this superhuman strength. They're not letting people go, go by. And yet they're still there, and they're, they're, you know, they're struggling away with whatever it is they're doing. And as soon as Jesus comes on the scene, you hear them speak out, but it's not them. It's not the men themselves. It's the demons that are inhabiting them speak to Jesus Christ. Jesus hasn't said a word yet. He's just shown up on the scene, and here it is, bam. What have we to do with you? Jesus, you son of God. Even the demons acknowledge God. You remember where James says that even the demons believe and they tremble? There's more truth in that sentence from the Bible than there are in volumes of theology written by men. The demons believe and they tremble. This is why you find passages such as the one in Philippians where it says that we are to work out our own salvation. This is why Isaiah says that the one, the one who hears my word and trembles at my word is the one that I am pleased with. These demons are fearful. We hear the son of God. What do we have to do? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They know that there's an appointed day. They know they're, they, you know, they are a, a, a beaten crew. They know that the final defeat is already accomplished. But they were hoping in the meantime to have a little bit of fun. Causing these men to try to hurt themselves and others. And the way Matthew records this is it tells us that not far from there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him. Please let us go. It's a herd of swine. In other words, we're ready to go and, and it, even if it means this temporal falling with the swine, at least we won't have to encounter the final judgment. We won't be tormented. And Jesus says one word. Go. And the men are here. Not like Benny Hinn. Not like the televangelists. Not like these false prophets and these fake faith healers. But a simple word. Go. Two letters, right? Go. Are in their life. They are completely healed. It says that the herd of swine, after the, the demons went into the herd, they ran off violently down the steep place into the sea, and the pigs now died. The demons didn't die, the pigs died. And it may be that the, the men were stronger than the pigs. They had stronger wills and they were able to resist the, 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 the demons. And, and they scratched themselves, beat themselves, pulled out their hair, you know, tried to hurt themselves with the chains. They did all these things. If you read the other accounts of, of the narrative, and, and they kept others from getting by. It was a final reaction from these men because of the demonic influence. But they didn't kill themselves. Had it come to them, the swine immediately ran down, and they died in the water. Well, 
brothers who kept pigs, they, they ran, they told everybody in the city, and they all came out to see Jesus. Where are the pigs? Our livelihood. Where are the pigs? We were getting ready to sell them. In fact, we've taken a deposit on them already. What are we going to do? The pigs, where are the pigs? They didn't believe the guys that told them. The pigs are all there. Yeah, right. Let's go see, right? The whole town comes out. No pigs but two men in their same mind stepping before them. And Jesus, the Son of God, in their very midst. And what do they tell him? They tell him, get out of here. We are more interested in our welfare and our livelihood and the way we are doing things that in you. In other words, we've never done it that way before. We know pizza forbidden, and we know that we shouldn't be doing that. But, hey, look, a great commodity. Gentiles come over and they buy them from us. We don't like to do things this way. We'd rather compromise, like this city, and tell Jesus that, no, we really don't want you the way you are. We'd rather have you the way we would like you. We'd like you to bless our sin. We'd like you to give us your okay with our plans. Just sign at the bottom of the list and then we'll fill it in. Just tell us that you're okay with it and then we'll let you know what the plan is. Folks, if there is a message for this new year out of this, and I don't know that there is. It is this, that we are all too prone to want to cut God down to where we are comfortable with Him. In other words, we domesticate the transcendent. We make Him manageable for our own home, our own household. We cut Him down to science. We teach Him to do tricks like we do with dogs. Say here, perform. We must be very wary of wanting to make Jesus into anything other than what He is. Himself. Idolatry of the mind is just as repulsive to God as idolatry. spiritual inventory that as we're reflecting on a year gone by that we've seen good things and maybe not so good things but let me remind you that all things come from the hand of God you know, this popular theology that says that all the good come to you comes from God and all the bad things come to you come from the devil is probably from the devil this theology is not the truth of scripture truth of scripture is my times are in your hands. The truth of scripture is that God has ordained the days of our lives, not only ordained them, but filled them with content even before there was one of them. Not only the length of our days, but the content of our days is determined by God Almighty. We are predestinated according to the counsel of His will. Think well, God determines the, the boundaries and He gives you freedom in between. No. no. God determines every single thing that occurs in this universe. From the number of your hairs to the form of the value of the sky. When a bird falls to the earth, Jesus falls. Nothing is out of God's control. We need to submit to the true God. And the only way to know if we are submitting to the true God is to know the true God. 
The only way to know the truth is to welcome him, hear his word, and heed his word. Not like these people turn him away. Not turn him away blatantly or turn him away politely without, eh, you know what, we'd rather do this. But to say, God, here I am. Here I am, send me. Here I am, ready, willing to do your bidding. Willing to do whatever it is your will is. Paul confronted Jesus on that Damascus road. He said, Lord, who are you? And when he said, I'm Jesus, he said, what do you want me to do? It's not about getting God to do your bidding. It's not about preferring your way of doing things like these men. Like many churches in the land. But truly saying to God, everything I am is yours. Everything I am, everything I am is yours. And we're going to count the days on the top, right? Number of days. Because when we are ready to leave this place, we will leave behind us everything we have, and we will take with us only that that we are. So, present for you, the one who welcomes God, he welcomes the true God, he welcomes everything about the true God. If you're one of those who prefers to be in charge and you cut and paste, Snip a little here, snip a little there. Ignore a passage here, ignore a passage there. Go away with swaths of scripture because it's not convenient. Or not conducive to so called ministry. Remember, he said to the disciples, It's the most important place. To be. The good news is that with God, it doesn't matter who you've been, it only matters who you will be. So who will you be? Father, thank you for allowing us to again contemplate your word and how it ministers to us. God, you're speaking to each of us here. And we all are trying to understand what you are telling us. remember that we worship the true living God. God, let us not be ashamed of any aspect of your revelation. Let us not be those who try to domesticate your word. Let us be willing to stand upon every soul. Every time you open. On the question, commit to you. Forgive us for our neglect, holy precepts. Whatever keeps me from the Bible, said one of your servants, does damage to my soul, irreparable damage. God, forgive us. Restore unto us. Joy of your salvation and lead us in the path of righteousness for thy name's sake. For we ask it all.